Good afternoon, all. So my topic today is on the importance of SDG 1 and 2 and the challenges and the possible solutions. So I'll start with explaining what poverty is um, away from the traditional definition. So it's more than lack of income. It's, uh, it's multiple deprivations. Uh, its effects last a lifetime for entire communities and sometimes for generations. It's discriminatory. It's a trap. Only a very few come out of it for good during their lifetime. It's an economic loss because it's, it's a waste of productive resources. Its existence is sometimes supported by design, the current uh, designs that we have um, in terms of economic structures and political structures. So I'll explain this. I'll illustrate this by um, giving you the story of Geet and Sonali. So these two individuals, let's take uh, life events like birth. So Sonali has a lesser chance of being born to begin with because her mother's uh, health might be uh, in a worse place than, than Geeta's. She might not have the best medical um, options or, or facilities available for her. So there's a discrimination there itself. So if she's somehow born, when it comes to food, it's very likely that Gita will have more nutritious food, access to food, uh, even on information uh, compared to what Sonali might have. Uh, and as a result, uh, she'll have poor health uh, issues, uh, poor health conditions. And if you take education, again, uh, Gita is very likely to have better access to better schools, better education facilities, better teachers uh, than Sonali. If you take sports, again, Gita is likely to have more better access to facilities, um, sports activities that will help physical development. Uh, and if you take university education, actually, it's very likely that Sonali might not get uh, university admissions. She might uh, probably stop her education halfway through because of poverty. Uh, and again, Gita has a higher chance of uh, getting to university because of her uh, uh, income and the background. Let's assume they both do and, and they go for employment. Again, Gita has a higher chance. If you think of a job interview, Gita has a higher chance of getting selected because of her, probably the confidence, the, the way she dresses, the language she speaks, uh, compared to Sonali. She might Gita might be more confident at the interview, but she might have better skills. So again, there's a uh, disadvantage for Sonali. Finances, Gita is more likely to have uh, a better financial situation uh, even after the uh, job because Sonali might be expected to support her family, children's uh, the siblings' education, uh, parents' health, things like that. And Marriage, even if you assume love is fair, still Gita will appear more confident, more healthy, might look better, uh, might be dressed, might dress better. So she has a better chance in that also. Uh, married life, again, Sunal is more likely to have problems, uh, financial problems, uh, housing problems, uh, transport problems, a lot of other stresses uh, Sunal is more likely to have than Gita. And life after 40, because of the li uh, life she has lived, uh, maybe with low nutritional food, uh, low physical activity, stress, everything, life after 40, Sonali might have more health issues, more mental health issues, physical health issues uh, than Gita. Uh, when it comes to disasters and crisis, again, Sonali will be at a, a worse position than 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 Gita. Sonali might be uh, might have uh, so, sorry Gita might have better access to uh, locations that are uh, not vulnerable to climate change. If there's economic crisis, it's Gita who's less likely to lose her job probably because of her experience, higher position, higher pay, uh, things like that compared to Sonali. Um, then. Children, the cycle repeats again with uh, Sonali's children. So this is uh, what actually poverty is. 
but over the years in at least in absolute numbers we've had successes more than 1.2 billion people have moved out of extreme poverty uh, across all regions the poverty rates absolute poverty rates have fallen from as high as 70 to 90 percent uh, during the last two centuries to less than 10 percent except in in sub-saharan africa but some of these trends are changing so with the emergence of covid 19 uh, some of these achievements have changed uh, and but even prior to the pandemic uh, the the momentum of poverty reduction has been slowing down this might be because of the base effects also because already a lot of people have graduated but now the trend is slowly changing and and a shocking revelation is that the resurgence of hunger levels uh, and of course increasing food prices in the past few years will contribute to this and as uh, as both previous speakers mentioned climate change will have an adverse impact on price uh, food uh, availability and food prices so again this is very likely to get worse um, and, and according to the uh, un report uh, poverty rate increased sharply from 8.3 to 9.2 percent in 2020 this is post pandemic and we expect the trend would have continued in the subsequent years because of the uh, economic developments that happen later so is this a temporary anomaly or a trend change so we believe it's a trend change one reason is the old economic model has completely changed the old factors of production in old economic model complemented poverty reduction but if you use the same policies in the new economic model it will actually make things worse then geopolitical changes the tensions have fractured and the 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 uh, trade investment travel flows are changing which is uh, changing against reducing poverty. Polycrisis, uh, increasing in frequency and intensity, this includes climate change, but also the global debt problem where a lot of countries have gotten into debt. There are fiscal problems experienced. Uh, a lot of countries, governments experience fiscal problems. There are wars, pandemics, then other sudden market disruptions. There's a change in attitude in terms of supporting poor, uh, probably because of the uh, success of the past few years or past few uh, centuries or decades. Uh, there's less talk of poverty and there's a lot of misconception on supporting the poor and to what level uh, they should be supported and also a problem of definition of what poverty is as I explained before. Uh, and the sole focus on good institutions are increasingly becoming insufficient. So I'll explain these later. So first on the model, policies fit for all model will only make things worse. Uh, so these are some of the articles. I I mean, there are a lot of articles uh, on the internet. If you look, I'll just focus on a few. Uh, global inequality has gotten worse with the richest 1% grabbing nearly two thirds of the 42 trillion of wealth newly created since 2020. Global, uh, uh, global inequalities seem to be about as great today as they were at the peak of Western imperialism in the early 20th century. So all these points to things getting worse. Uh, so why this has happened? So one is the economic model has changed completely. We had previously land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship as factors of production, and they are being replaced by data, technology, knowledge, and creativity now. So you don't need land to build a business on now. You can do it on data. You don't need labor uh, to uh, function that business, you, you can use employee technology. Uh, capital, previously it was money uh, or finance, now it's just money and finance. Knowledge is the new capital. You can use money and finance to uh, find data, find uh, deploy technology, um, create knowledge, and entrepreneurship is creativity. So, but the policies, what we've done historically, uh, for example, uh, when it comes to finance, we found historically that financial concentration is better compared to financial distribution. In the old economic model, you rather give a large loan to a company uh, to support capital formation that creates employment, that reduces poverty, and the returns on financial concentration are higher as opposed to distribution. You wouldn't take uh, $1 million and give it to 1 million people. It was far better to give $1 million to one person who would generate employment 
and uh, uh, give a return. But if you put this, if you apply the same principle to new factors of production, it leads to automation, robotics, AI, things like that. That will lead to higher unemployment, higher increased poverty, and higher inequality. But now the model has changed, and actually, you get higher returns for financial distribution. On one side is the risk. So if you concentrate on a, 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 a larger creditor, because of poly crisis, you are putting that money at risk. Whereas distribution now is a is a better way of managing that risk. And if you look at where to put that money, where that distribution, how that distribution should happen, you can, if you spend it on education to make knowledge freely available, if you invest it on data to make access very public, if you invest on uh, ensuring cheap and uh, cheap access and easy access to uh, technology, if you invest to reorient education and skills to promote creativity, that will generate a much higher return than financial concentration uh, did uh, previously in the previous model. If you look at uh, pricing, actually it costs more to be poor than rich. Uh, if you look at finance and telecommunication, two most critical facilitators of the new economic model, they are unfairly priced. Uh, poor pay higher per MB per minute. Uh, and these are often prepaid customers in uh, markets uh, and they pay higher in terms of borrowing uh, when they borrow and they get the lowest interest in, ter uh, in terms of deposits and it's it's not really risk based pricing because if you as i told you if you look at bank non performing loans it's the in, in terms of absolute number of loans yes the the retail sector will contribute more but if you take the value which is what matters for financial institutions if you take value then it's not the small people who contribute to who contribute most uh, so therefore the the uh, the risk pricing is misplaced but it's sometimes supported by regulation also like IFRS 9 or parcel regulations that support uh, or that discourage because of high impairment provisioning uh, lending to retail and SME segments. Uh, and sometimes some of these prices are, are uh, absurd because it's uh, it's even with security. If you take gold loans or pawning, you have a, a good loan to value ratio, uh, it's secure yet you charge the highest interest on those customers. Um, similarly, education, healthcare, nutrition, everything is unfairly priced because best quality is available for the highest payer. And often the best quality is required for the people who can afford it the least uh, in terms of nutrition. So uh, there is a problem. Again, climate adaptation, mitigation is unfairly priced. Rich has better access to safer locations, better government care, better technological solutions. Data as a public good. Uh, so data is the new land. Uh, now a lot of focus is on a lot of focus is there on liberalizing factor markets, traditional factor markets. No one's talking about the new factor markets. Uh, there's a huge information asymmetry that benefits the rich. Although majority of the people, that is uh, again middle income and poor people who contribute to uh, generation of this data, its access is uh, disproportionate. Only a minority has access to it and, and they benefit from it. And if you make data publicly available, that will reduce the knowledge gap and it will support and reinforce proper initiatives such as proper assessment of risk, fair pricing, information availability, effective information, things like that. And it will also increase trust and understanding in the society. Easy access to data will also promote innovation and distribute income make it a better, uh, a fairer playing field for the poor. That will give equal opportunities. If you look at uh, reducing costs to improve access to technology and education, technological cost and education has been coming down. It has come down drastically, but still the, the passing on that benefit to the poor has been very low and slow. Uh, and it's often controlled by by middle parties for their own benefit and profit. A uh, lot of technology costs have come down. Uh, cost of education has come down. These were considered finite resources previously, but now it's not. Uh, a, a single university can, with technology, can educate the whole world now. 
uh, you don't need multiple institutions, multiple teachers, uh, things like that. Uh, so investing in removing barriers and providing easy and cheap access to technology and education can have a significant impact on improving the living standards of the poor. So if you look at new factors of production, actually a, a, a local businessman in Sri Lanka invested and created this education platform that, that offers free education, uh, both the, the local uh, government syllabus plus technological education. So governments and multilateral organizations can do much more to make education and technology accessible. Then shift the, this strong focus on institutions. So we've long known that institutions are necessary but insufficient, but it's increasingly becoming insufficient because often we've put institutions uh, to cover up for the shortfalls by people. But that has re resulted in us creating institution upon institution upon institution to prevent problems, whereas the problem is with the people who sometimes run these institutions. So, and there are attitude changes that even support the poor uh, in terms of institutions, in terms of support those institutions get, and in terms of the support those institutions provide to uh, people. There is a huge misconception. There was a survey done in UK where there was a huge misconception among the top rich people, uh, top richest 10%, uh, I think, on uh, the poverty and, and the uh, role they should play in reducing poverty and the benefits the poor get. So there is a, a huge task that needs to uh, be done on in terms of education uh, and, and promoting people development uh, to combat poverty. As I uh, showed in the first example, no institution can cover all those accepts and the discrimination a person goes through in life. So you need to educate people on those things. Then taxing consumption, I think uh, uh, previous speakers also mentioned this, there is excessive consumption. And to redistribute income, we are taxing income, but is that sufficient? And, and as people get richer and income sources diversify, it becomes very difficult to track income. So instead, can we look at taxing consumption? And right now, the current VAT systems uh, make poor bear a higher burden than the rich. So can we use technology to, uh, I think it's already possible to, to uh, make ta taxes dynamic and, and link to your consumption. Uh, and that will also prevent or slow climate change initiatives. Uh, so Sri Lanka as a test case, Sri Lanka went through all of this uh, during uh, the past few years. So Sri Lanka was a very successful case in terms of graduating into upper middle income countries. But then uh, we uh, experienced multiple shocks, governance issues uh, that pushed national poverty again back to 25% and it's going up further. A uh, lot of vulnerability, uh, debt related indicators, including debt for essential needs like food, medical care and education. Uh, and all of these led to social unrest that led to a government change that dangerously went, came close to anarchy. Uh, and Sri Lanka is among the top 10 most vulnerable countries to climate change. So I took this quote from, from uh, the UN site, SDG site, why should I care about other people's economic situation? Uh, there are many reasons, I'll uh, read it out, but in short, because I'm, as humans, as human beings, our well-being is linked to each other. Growing inequality is detrimental to economic growth, undermines social cohesion, increasing political and social tensions and some, in, some, in some circumstances driving instability and conflict. This is exactly what we experienced in the recent past. And it will only make everyone worse off than before. So I'll win with a uh, image that I uh, got the help of a local cartoonist to draw. So right now on both these scales, the, the weight is increasing and it's putting pressure on the political, social and economic order already and on top of that there are shocks in terms of pandemics climate change war economic crisis that will make things worse and that will that threatens the social political and economic order and if that gets disrupted everyone will be worse off and this is not a only a third world country phenomena we see it globally uh, we see it in the 
referendum that was done in, in Australia. Uh, we see it in, in UK, we see it in US. We see these tensions globally. So this is a global problem and, and focusing on addressing this is very important. Thank you.